six years ago, five years ago, my wife and I had been married for a year. We had just had our daughter Emily, and she was six weeks old, and we were invited to participate in a conference in California on family issues. And we cared a lot about the family, um, but honestly, I was in the category of, I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman, and I believe in family, but I don't know how to defend it to, to other people, particularly people who don't share my faith. Um, so that's the category I was in. So we went to this conference with our six-week-old baby. We spent three days learning from amazing people. Some of them have been here. Um, people who talked about the physiology of family and the science of family and the legal issues behind divorce and separating children from parents and the legal issues behind same-sex parenting and why kids need a mom and a dad and, I, and why families affect the economy. And we had all these experts talking to us. And we came home so excited, but in the back of my mind I was thinking, okay, I have all this information, but all these people around me have no idea about all these things. And I could see my friends, at that time we were at BYU, I could see, which is a, which is a Christian church-sponsored school, I could see my friends at BYU who believed in family and believed that marriage was between a man and a woman and that kids should have a mom and dad, but they didn't know how to talk about those things or how to tell other people why they believed that. They didn't know how to answer those questions. They didn't have the vocabulary or the, or the understanding of the science or the, or the legal issues to be able to defend their belief in family. And so I started to, um, over the next few months after this conference, I started to think about how can I help all these people because I knew that my peers at, at BYU were going to leave BYU and go off and have successful careers all around the world and they were going to have opportunities to defend the family and they weren't going to have the vocabulary or the understanding to do it. And so, um, so I started to develop this concept in my mind um, of small reading groups with friends where we could disseminate this information to the people around us in a safe place um, and help them gain the vocabulary and the understanding that they needed to defend the family. So we tried it. We tried it at BYU. Um, we invited a whole bunch of our friends and we put together four topics that we wanted to cover and we pulled out our notes from the conference and, and um, we, talked to, we had people over to our home and we talked about one topic a week and it was really successful and our friends were so appreciative and they were able to all of a sudden be able to talk about these things um, in the right way. And then life got crazy and we moved and I didn't really do anything with it for a couple of years and then we moved to Salt Lake and I got involved with some other people who were interested in reading groups and we started a whole bunch of reading groups around the state of Utah. And now in Utah there have been slash are um, approximately 30 30 reading groups. Um, and we've also been able to, um, uh, we've also, we're also connected to other, other groups that have started in other states. So there are reading groups now in many states around the United States and um, starting internationally in a few countries. Um, let me take this minute to say that the, that the program is wrong. I was supposed to say this at the very beginning. <laughs> the program's wrong. It's in one part of the program it says that I um, am the founder of Canebox, and that is absolutely not true. It's just not. So I don't, somebody wrote that in. <laughs> okay. So I have worked with Canebox, and we'll talk about Canebox in a minute, but I, I don't represent them or work for them, and I am for sure not the founder. Okay. So just want to make that clear. Okay, so um, that's why I started reading groups. I started reading groups because there are people all around me who believe in marriage and don't know how to talk about it. And particularly my generation is going to have to be able to defend their beliefs and have the right vocabulary to do that. So I'm going to talk now about um, what is a reading group. Some people when they hear reading group think it's like a book club or something. I'm not sure like uh, people um, uh, sitting around talking still environment without things. Okay. That's not a reading group is. Okay. So a reading group is a group of your close friends or family that you choose to invite 
that come to your home periodically. It can be once a week, it can be once every two weeks, it can be once a month. And they come to your home um, and talk about a designated topic. And before they come, you send them a couple of readings, not a book or anything scary, but just like maybe a short article. We try to do a scientific article and then maybe a story, an article about somebody's actual life story. Um, somebody raised by same-sex parents or somebody from a broken home or somebody... Um, anyway, so we try to connect the science with the human story. And it can be an article and a video, or it can be two articles, or whatever. And you come together after having read slash watched those things, and you discuss it and you practice talking about that issue at the right way. And you talk through your questions about that issue, and questions that other people have brought to you about that issue, and everybody just practices understanding um, the issue that you're talking about that day. Okay. So that's what a reading group is. It's just a, it's just a way to bring people to your home periodically um, to talk about certain issues. Now, I like to do reading groups with a definite start time and a definite end time. And so I do reading groups for four to six weeks, and people know up front we're going to do it once a week for six weeks, and people can mentally commit to that, and we can get through several topics in that time. And then I invite new people, and we do another reading group. What's your um, time limit? for the session. It's up to you. Mm -hmm. Ours are generally an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, you can do it during the day. If, if there are a bunch of um, parents at home during the day that you'd like to invite over. Uh, we have parents bring children to ours because that's my age group. Everybody around this is newly married with kids. Um, we, you can do it in the evening, whatever. It's totally flexible. But that's the concept is that you periodically have people to your home and you talk about issues. Now the other thing that's important about reading groups is that in order to talk about an issue in your home, you don't have to be the expert. Okay, so to do a reading group, the beauty of reading groups is that people can come together and discuss an issue and learn together. Um, you don't have to, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a lecture and you're not um, the leader of whatever. You're just facilitating a discussion and helping people understand the issues better. Okay, any questions up to this point? Yes? Would you um, encourage non-like minds to gather? Like an my atheist friend and my Baptist friend? That's, that's a really good question. So what I've chosen to do is I'll sort of focus on a certain social circle because I want, when people come, I want it to be a safe place where they can express their concerns about the family, where they can ask their hardest questions, um, and where they can practice telling other people about the family without uh, feeling threatened. So I've tried to keep the people that I'm, I try to invite people that kind of know each other, but that's not necessary. I've also been in reading groups where people didn't really know each other and it worked okay. So it's just something to think through. Other questions? Yes. I have a question. What about content? What have you used to discuss to, as a platform to use family friendly? Absolutely. I'll answer that briefly and then we're going to get into it later. Okay. Um, so, content is up to you, but some of the issues that I've covered in my reading groups are um, what is marriage and what public values <coughs> serve? Um, what are the complementary roles of men and women? How do mothers and fathers contribute uni uniquely to a child's development? How does divorce or cohabitation affect adults and children? Um, we covered understanding same-sex attraction, um, which is a, a real thing that people deal with, understanding it with compassion. We've covered um, the differences between same-sex parenting and heterosexual parenting. Um, we've covered, uh, some groups have covered pornography, um, communication in marriage, friendship in marriage. Um, so. So, for sure, the reading groups have focused on topics that are going to strengthen marriage. Um, but other than that, the content is really up to you and what you feel like your audience could use. Cool. Other questions before we move on? Okay, great. So that's what a reading group is. Okay, now let me explain why reading groups have been so successful. Um, so I am a total believer in reading groups, not just because I do them, but because I have seen what happens um, out of, what comes out of reading groups. 
So um, a couple of the benefits of reading groups, at least for, for those that have, that have attended mine, and I've held about six reading groups now and consulted in maybe three or three or four others and trained people this, and trained um, about 50, 50 leaders who want to start their own reading groups. Um, so I've been able to talk to a lot of people who have done groups. Um, so a couple of the benefits. It creates a safe place for people to ask their hardest questions. One thing we do at the beginning of our reading groups is explain that this is the place that you can bring the questions that you can't answer. If you have questions from your friends that you can't answer about your beliefs, you can bring them here and we can talk through them. Um, it, it creates a safe place to practice responding to questions. Um, in my other work on the family, I've had a lot of opportunities to speak to the media. And the, the media is a really rough place to practice. <laughs> it's a really hard place to practice your responses. So it creates a safe place for people to practice responding about the issues and, and become comfortable with that before they try to deliver to, in a place where it really, where it really matters. Um, people come away from reading groups educated, empowered. They come away more compassionate, more compassionate about the issues that we discuss. They come away with the right vocabulary to talk about um, sensitive topics. They come away with concrete answers for their friends. Um, and they come away with, uh, with uh, an understanding that kind of fires them to become involved. Um, so those are some of the benefits of reading groups. Can I Mary? say one more? Yeah. Um, one thing I've seen is just it is so cool to get together in a room and be building friendships around this and you start to find that you have a network of support and so when something goes wrong at, at school or they're trying to pass some sex education thing you have somebody that you already know is with you and that they understand things in depth and that you can say hey we need to do something about it. you've got a posse yeah you really do and people will and you have people that now you know feel the same way as you and you can take issues too that's absolutely right um, there are a few people in here who have participated in reading groups and I've asked them to stand up and just share their experiences and what they um, got out of reading groups. So can we start with Mamie? Awesome. So I'm Mamie Hammer and I'm from New Mexico and um, one of the things that I like about reading groups are that it gives me a way to be involved. I've wanted to be involved for years. I love the family and have a belief in the family and know how important it is. But I didn't know how to get involved in a way that would really make a difference. I'm a mother of nine, and um, I'm in the home all the time. And I'm not out a lot, but I do have a group of friends. And so we um, had a reading group last fall and talked about a lot of these topics. And it was, like Dave said, very empowering. Um, gave us the vocabulary to use out amongst other people that are not so like-minded. Um, that's compassionate vocabulary but also um, very strong. And um, anyway, so it, gave, it helped empower me to feel like I was contributing, but in a way that I could handle as a mother. And um, it also helped me to know how to teach my own children in ways that I hadn't even thought through before. But thinking through it with other people helps you to know how to use vocabulary with your own children so that they know the issues, but in a way that is very safe. Awesome. Thanks. Mary, do you want to go next? Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, in all honesty, <laughs> um, I've, I've done a couple, and um, I think the coolest one was with my family um, because we have a gay nephew, and it was so it was so foreign to my family. They just really had no idea how to even process that. Um, or relate to him, uh, relate to what was happening to him personally. Um, so uh, it, it created a really great opportunity and, and it, a benefit for our family, I guess. It brought our family closer together. Um, and then interestingly, after, it seems like we're all Americans, or a lot of us are, after the Obergefell decision, my brother-in-law I'm sorry if I'm taking too long. My brother-in-law um, went to work at a very large company here in Utah, and 
the administration said, isn't this great? It's time to celebrate that they've passed gay marriage in America and everybody needs to put up a rainbow on all of your social media at work. And he couldn't do that. No, he's not going to celebrate this thing. Um, and that created a crisis for every Christian in that company. And um, because he had been to these groups and he had looked at the issue more than just once, he had come five or six times, <coughs> he had words that were powerful in articulating why I'm not going to participate in this thing that my managers are telling me to do. And what was interesting was that none of his peers had that. And so they all, all of them that resisted were all uh, called on the carpet by their managers, but he came out unscathed. The rest of them were literally put on probation and it affected their jobs and went in their <coughs> personal files as employees, <coughs> but he was able to come out of it okay. Um, and then I think the other thing is just having it's really exciting, really invigorating to have answers to really hard questions, like <coughs> things that you wouldn't normally have, like, you know, what, shouldn't we just allow homosexuality for uh, homosexuals to adopt and some of those harder questions after you know what marriage is? Please do another question. There are seats right up here. This is totally informal. You're just fine. Thank you, Mary, for sharing that. Um, we just had, and then one more. Kelly, would you stand up and Hi, share? Hi, I'm Kelly. Um, I'm an emerging le leader, and David and his wife, Melissa, planted this seat for me. I used to live here at University of Utah. I was his neighbor, and just three months ago, I moved with my husband to Oakland, California, for a PhD program. Um, they invited us to their home to talk about it and started the conversation in our home. And that's why I'm here. I would not be at this conference. Sorry. I should have warned you I'd cry. Um, <laughs> because it wasn't something I knew how to talk about or that I cared so much about. And um, they, for the reading group, really helped us define a lot of the questions. Because even if I believe it religiously, I still don't know. Um, I still can get really confused on um, all the whys and all the logistics. And so because of that, um, I still definitely feel like I'm still emerging like, and don't have all the answers. I'm not ready to be the expert, but I, that's why I'm here. And that's why I'll go home to California now um, and hopefully have some influence and make a little ripple. Awesome. Thanks. I wanted to... Um share one other story. We had some friends um, in our neighborhood and they were really struggling with um, their, they felt like all the, all the messages they were getting from the popular media were that um, they should support um, gay rights and gay marriage and, and the, the definition of marriage was outdated and the information they were getting from their church was opposite and they didn't know how to reconcile the two. And they came to us and said, we're having this struggle, and we want to know if you can, if you have any ideas, how can we get more information? So we invited them to one of our reading groups, and they have, um, and they totally uh, kind of turned around um, over the course of several weeks as we met in our reading group, and they actually volunteered at this conference and have and have attended here, and um, so I, as as a Millennial, I feel really strongly that my generation needs um, needs answers. They need answers quickly, and um, I wanted to say one more thing. Uh, in addition to doing reading groups, I've been involved in a lot of uh, family issue type activism, and um, as part of that, I've I've put on rallies and I've put on events and I've participated in conferences like this and I've participated in social media campaigns, but I feel that the issues we face in the family are so complex that nobody can understand them from a meme, nobody can understand them from a rally, and nobody can understand them from an op-ed, which, which I've also written. 
Um, people can only understand them if they take the time to dig a little bit deeper, and that's what reading groups allow us to do. So when we have reading groups, the people that leave the reading groups um, are are changed for a lifetime. They have a, they have a deep, lasting understanding of, of family issues. And that's a type of change that we can't achieve in other types of activism. So that's why we keep doing it. We just do it over and over. We keep having reading groups. OK, um, any comments or questions at this point? Great, OK, yeah. Uh -huh. I also think that it's so empowering for people coming to realize that they are not alone. Um, so many of us have this belief in the family. But because all that we are doing is listening to media or the loudest voice, we feel like maybe those around us aren't on the same page. But when we come to a reading group, then we find that. We find that, yes, most of us are still on the same page. Most of us believe in the family. And that's so empowering. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. Yes? Where do you get most of your material, like the research and the experience, and to use for your reading group? Question. Yeah, so when I first when I started my first reading group, I got it from my own notes from a conference I'd just been through. Now there are better resources, and I'm going to show you those uh, toward the end. Yes. They all online. <coughs> online, yes. <coughs> okay. <laughs> Some people ask that, and then they get upset. That's great. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, how do you get over people being uh, not wanting to share their feelings on certain topics they're sensitive? Great. Yeah, I think um, part of it is creating a safe space in the beginning. We've seen we we've, we've seen lots of reading groups now, and and it often starts. The first session is is uh, everybody's just a little careful, and then by session two and session three, people realize what it is, and they feel safe with each other, and they share more and more without you having. We we never drag things out of people. We just invite them to share. Discuss and they automatically open up. That's been our experience. Yes. Just concerning the type of group, would you um, consider it safe or encourage, like, me to host one for young, like, middle school or high schoolers, even if they, because then I would feel like I would be more of a like leader. Yeah, instead of a facilitator, because I'm not actually like they might not have any opinions at all. On it. You know, I think, um, number one, yes, that junior high and high school kids need this worse than anyone, I feel. Mm -hmm. um, number two, although you're older than they are, I still feel like you can create an environment where mm -hmm. they feel empowered to speak and that you're not dominating the conversation and you can still be a facilitator. Okay. So, yeah, I would, yes. I, I think one thing that m might be helpful, it, it depends on the the community dynamic that you're working with there but um, just oh everybody's so sensitive to this topic sometimes when you're working with youth it can be a good idea to talk to their parents first or even make it like a mother-daughter kind of thing um, that gives them an opportunity you know to help the moms even have that conversation with their kids about those questions that they have you know um, but also give the parents the comfort and respect to know that they are going to be involved in the conversation. Yes, two more comments. She's first. I would also just say that it's safer legally to include parents in the process. For sure. Because I feel like there can be a lot of a lot of interesting things happening if you just approach kids and ask them to come, unless you have the parents. That's part of it. Didn't learn Absolutely. Great point. What do you do? You said you don't have to be the expert. Right. So what would you say is not the expert? How do you do that? Great. I wish my sister Katie were here. Katie um, lives in Payson, and she came to one of our trainings for reading group leaders. She was like, okay, whatever, Dave. And she like, she's like, okay, I want to start one, but I know nothing. And so, but she did it. She did it. Um, she got the curriculum that we'll look at in a minute. Um, she got the materials and she literally did nothing more than send out the email and read what she asked her group members to read. And she had a phenomenal experience. And so I feel like the the readings 
um, kind of speak for themselves, um, and and you can really have very little background and still come away with a lot of understanding. Okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna give everybody a break. So here's here's what we're gonna do. Everybody's like, wait, does this really go to four o'clock? Okay, <laughs> this is the only time that we're going <laughs> that we're gonna be like lecturing like this. Okay, this is really gonna be a workshop. So I just want to take that time to help you understand what are reading groups, and the rest of the time we're gonna spend doing. Okay, so for fifteen minutes, um, I have thirty of these. I think that's enough. But if people need to share, it will be fine. Um, this is a reading. Okay, I'm giving you a reading, and I'm going to give you a 15-minute break. During the break, I want you to read the reading, and when you come back, um, a few people in the room are going to come up here and do a mock reading group based on this reading. Okay, and you can kind of see how it goes and ask your questions, um, and then after that, we'll have some more activities. So. I have a question. Oh. Yes. So um, someone was saying, um, talking about how, like, if you have a group with high schoolers or middle schoolers, um, then you have to get parents involved. Um, like, as a as someone who is still in high school, if I made a group with some of my fellow high schoolers, would I need to get the parents involved as well? So I I think that's up to you and. I, Honestly, I think parents are going to be happy um, that it's happening, but I, um, I, here's my totally unprofessional opinion. The high schooler's job is to tell their mom. <laughs> that's, that's, okay. my, that's my opinion, okay. I don't think you should be worried about the legalities, but I think okay. inviting your friends over is a great idea. Yeah. Okay, did everybody get one? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, we're gonna. I'm gonna take two volunteers. Um, this is like not hard. Okay, so who wants to be a volunteer? Two people. Yes, thank you, brave soul. Okay, one other one. Thank you. Okay, will you guys come up here and sit in these chairs, and then um, Mamie and Mary will you come up as well? And we're gonna do a mock reading group. Okay. So, let's just pull the chairs around the table and um, pretend that we're in a living room, okay? I'll sit in this one and you guys can sit wherever. And so, I told you before that my reading groups typically run about an hour and a half. Um, and typically we would have two readings, or sometimes I like to do a reading and a video. Um, my age group loves videos. So um, typically we would have like a, 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 this was the more scientific article, and then we'd also have like a personal story. And there are plenty of those about this topic. Um, so we're only going to do like half a reading group, okay? We're just going to talk about this article, but normally it would last longer and we would talk about all the articles you read or, or whatever, whatever the reading was, okay? So let's begin. So thanks everybody for coming. And remind me your names. Leland Debbie. and Debbie. Okay. And this is Mamie and Mary, and I know them, so but we didn't want it all the sheet, so you guys are joining us. <laughs> it's great. Okay. Um, so this week's topic is the no difference claim. As we read in the article, the no difference claim is the claim that same-sex parenting and heterosexual parenting have the exact same effect on kids. And so, um, what were some of your thoughts about this article? What were some of the things that stood out to you? One thing that, that I noticed first off is that um, the sample research done to support that claim was flawed, very flawed. In what way? They didn't have very many, a good sample to start with. It was a very limited sample. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, picking back on that, just that it says here on the first page that most of the research compared gay and lesbian parenting to single divorce or step parenting. Or uh, would you selectively kind of socioeconomically privileged population of gay parents? 
to a broad representative sample of the general population. So it looks like there was some, perhaps, um, politicizing of the science, or at least some bias increasing it. Right? So if this is true. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I think it's significant that they said, did they, did they give the number 59, I think? Mm -hmm. Yes. 59 studies that report that there's no difference, right? So the no difference claim is based on 59 studies. So, I mean, it sounds really legitimate, but when you look closer at the research, it was, it was, it was poorly conducted research. It also says they were very small, so they probably not representative. Whereas it did point out there was one other study that used a large random sample. So I, I thought too, I was very impressed how they established thoroughly uh, the methodology and the reliability for the use of it. Yeah, that's great. Any other thoughts about it? Most of this went over my head. <laughs> I think sometimes it's hard to do things like this, but one thing that I, if I understood it right, it sounded like the studies that were faulty also were um, asking the questions of the gay parents, as opposed to asking the children. This, the new study said the ch children were asked once they were young adults about their experiences. So the new study was looking more at the children and how it really did affect them instead of parents Assuming they know how their children are training. Yeah, because parents have that you know, great interest in telling you My kids are awesome. My kids are great. <laughs> <laughs> They're well adjusted. I'm a fantastic parent. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, children always tell you if they like the food or not. They're very honest. <laughs> <laughs> so, has anybody had experience with somebody saying this to you that? Um, same-sex parenting is exactly the same, or raising the issue of same-sex parenting. Have, has anybody encountered that? Well, I think, I mean, nobody's like said it to me personally, but that phrase, no difference, has become like a cliche. It's like part of the popular vocabulary now that we've established this. We don't even need to talk about numbers anymore because there's no difference, you know? Yeah. And, so in that small way, it, it creeps up in conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I also would think that my kids are probably hearing that, even if I'm not in my circle of friends. They're probably uh, hearing that from their school teachers or from peers at school, from their friends. Absolutely. Yeah, there are several pushes in public curriculum to make sure that all types of families are described and the kids know that all are equal. But that kind of makes the kids feel good, which I think might have been the original intent, but it also creates this problem that kids grow up thinking like, well, oh, well then it doesn't affect, it doesn't affect the kids at all when the science suggests otherwise. Well, I think that probably the Supreme Court decision based a lot of I haven't read the whole decision, but <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they use that research as some of their rationale. And one other thought I had is that Sesame Street has kind of gone that way to you know, all families are okay, you know. They're brainwashing our kids from the time they're preschoolers. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so. What are some of the, so let's get into some of these details. What are some of the things that stood out to you as far as the um, outcomes for kids of same-sex parents? Um, some of the outcomes that surprised you or that you thought were particularly about, what were some of your favorite statistics, I guess, that came out of this? I don't know if favorite's the right word. Uh, shocking. Shocking, okay. right. That's a better word. <laughs> or at least of concern, right? Yeah. Um, when you look at the uh, section that talks about social outcomes, uh, which is the first section. Uh, the second paragraph, though, talks about, or the third paragraph, I'm sorry, sexual victimization. And there's this common view that perhaps same-gender parents are just as loving or are just as loving. And yet the survey of the, of the sample says that only 2% of young children in intact biological families report touched sexually. 
whereas 23% of lesbian mothers reply to non metasexual. That to me is really a surprise. And um, it makes me question why, what is the cause of that? And then with the gay fathers, three times this many uh, having been forced to have sex, 25% of children with gay fathers, 31% of lesbian very high percentages in comparison with the entire biological family. It's almost painful to look at. I remember the first time I saw that, it took me like a week to get over it, but um, after a while that actually turned into kind of, forgive this, but almost inspirational because just to look at the difference between, between the outcome of a child raised in a fatherless home as compared to the outcome of a child raised in a motherless home. There are things going on in each of those homes, and it, it teaches us about how important those missing fathers are, how important those missing mothers are. And, and so, in a way, there are positive lessons to be learned there. It shows the value of the family yeah. structure. Yeah, and, and almost interesting that, uh, that there was, um, a, that being, having two loving mothers, hurrah for that, but, uh, they didn't have the protection of having a father who understands <laughs> evil motives that come from outside of the home and protect those daughters. In a way, frankly, that's cool to look at. Yeah, that's, that's really that's really. I think it also ties in with this first paragraph under emotional and mental health outcomes. It's talked about um, the children of lesbian mothers reported the lowest levels of perceived safety <coughs> And their child at home, which again points to the father's role as being a protector and how important that is for children to have that father. There's the yeah. that's, that's fascinating. Okay, so what I want us to do is um, look through the look through the article, find your favorite statistic, and <coughs> let's practice answering this question. Um, but aren't homosexual and heterosexual parents the same for kids? Because I think we're going to get that at some point in our lives. So look through the paper and look, find your favorite thing that you want to say about it, and then let's go around and practice answering why we don't um, support that conclusion that, that homosexual and heterosexual parenting is the same. Mary, do you have? I'm going to go last. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll start, but I have to look for a second at my favorite. Liz, could you go find out who that media person was that just took that photograph? I think she was. See them? Was there, this man. was a guy. It was a man. Oh, I'm man. sorry. I didn't see him. Thanks. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. That's great. says to me, um, but isn't it the same? It, doesn't a child just need two parents, two loving parents? Doesn't matter. Right. Two loving parents is all I need. Um, I think I would say, um, you know, children. Um, there, there, there was a really great study done about um, children who grew up with gay parents and lesbian parents, and one of the findings was that. Um, children of, of lesbian mothers were almost four times more likely to be currently on public assistance, um, and so, so we can see that that um, that man woman marriage and heterosexual parenting actually does something for children to help them grow up and be self sustaining, um, and those advantages may not be there for children too. 
were raised by two moms or two dads. Um, the reason I said that is because it's a shout out to my libertarian friends <laughs> who, who think we should just get out of marriage altogether. Um, but the point is, when marriage breaks down, we need more public assistance. And you can see that, um, uh, that, uh, that children do best, children do, are, are better contributors to society than pigs from um, the home of the mother and father. Whew, okay, whose turn is, who's going next? <laughs> you next? Sure. Okay. Well, to be honest, um, David, I, I uh, you know, if someone were to ask me why uh, or isn't it just the same, I think I might say that, uh, you know, what do you think? Do you really believe that it is the same? In my my personal experience was that I have grown up with parents who, um, who love me and who are intact biologically married family. I have a multi-generational family and I've experienced that. Uh, I know that there are many wonderful people who may even have the best of intentions of raising a child, you know, of two women or two men. And yet my belief, religiously, I would have to bring this in, David, yeah. uh, is that that is not the way God intended us. I do believe in God. I do believe that He loves us, that He is our Father, and that because He wants us to be, to enjoy what He enjoys, He gives us commandments. And some of those commandments um, are hard to live. In fact, a lot of them are, for a lot of us. And um, those commandments include uh, chastity, right? We can do chastity before marriage and after marriage. There are lots of great studies. And we can look at the outcomes, the social outcomes for children, and how intact biological, intact biological families have children who, for lots of whatever reason, role modeling reasons, safety reasons, concern reasons of, of, of knowing that both of their parents who conceive them biologically, genetically love them and love each other. And, you know, there might be lots of reasons for the social science. Um, but, you know, I, if you start with the idea that, that God has given us commandments and expects us to tame our passions, then, then we should do that. Right? And, and he expects me not to eat too much chocolate, maybe, right? I need to take care of I might have a vice for anger or for drug addiction or for any other, and he still would like me to attain that. And so if I want to raise a child, and it's not in the plan that God ordained naturally for us, then either is an overdose on drugs, right? I should take that. That would probably be part of my response. I would certainly use some of these social sites, but, but the, the first starting point David and his role play is that I would, I would have to go to the God. I think that's fantastic. And um, so I think that's a great starting point. And the place for this is in the follow-up question where they say, so I don't believe in God, so is there anything else you can point to for me? You know? So, But I think it's great to it's so a great study. It's regular study yeah. with others. But let's, let's look at outcomes, let's science outcomes. Awesome. And I, th I think one thing about that is, is the studies I mean, it's not like you're going to be able to memorize this. It's not like you're going to be, right. in a lot of ways, this is just for you to have the pleasure of knowing that the numbers are with you, you know? Yeah. But one thing that this study does do in a simple way is just to recognize you have to think through this in a simple way. A kid has a mom. A kid has a dad. They grow up in a certain environment. They have a relationship with a mom and a dad, hmm. and we can see how those relationships play out and that they have effects on their kids. And when you start to think about it, just slowly, slowly thinking about it, you can just realize, oh, two moms can't replace a dad. And, and just, uh, it comes down to that child's right to just have a relationship. And, and you don't need the statistics to even back up. I mean, yeah, they're there, and we can pull them out. 
but a child has a right to have that relationship and to have uh, they have that interest in what's going on in their home. And to me, that's kind of what's valuable about the statistics is that it recognizes that's worth looking at. Yeah. Awesome. So what if they said, what if they pushed you and said, but where's your proof that two dads can't be the same as a mom and dad? <laughs> two, dads, two dads aren't the same as a mom and dad. Where's your proof? The two, Where's your are you group? suggesting that two men could be a woman? That is the strangest one <laughs> I could ever imagine. <laughs> try it again. Try it again. <laughs> I'm trying, maybe I need to focus more. So, so you said that a kid deserves a mom and dad, but can't two loving dads or two loving moms be sufficient? Can they be sufficient? Yeah, I'm asking you to practice your spot. I, I just don't. No, I don't think two dads can equal a mom. I, I'm sorry. That's. That doesn't mean, the question doesn't even make sense to me. I'm sorry. And that's honestly what I would do. I would just laugh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what I want you to do, Mary, is I want you to just practice saying, um, just saying, you know, I don't believe that two dads could be a mom and a dad. And then can you pull out one of these statistics that we just found and say, here's one way that they can't, that they're not the same. Can you, can you practice saying that for me? Okay. I feel like I'm going to fail, David. Um, <laughs> um, well, I, I think that when you look at the, um, the specifics of outcomes for children, uh, you see that uh, children raised with a mom uh, have different outcomes than children raised by a single dad. They have different outcomes, but that are uniform to those genders. And that tells you that a man and a woman are different, and it, that a child has a different relationship with their dad than they have with their mom. But I think it's more valuable to go to a personal level and say, David, how much of who you are is because of who your dad was? And which one of your parents would you be willing to give up for the sake of sexual rights? That's a great question. Good job. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Um, By the way, I'm not the judge of good responses. We're just practicing here. Okay? I don't know that mine comes from here either, but um, I think I would respond by saying that when they paint a picture of a happy lesbian family or a happy gay family and their children involved, there's always a broken home behind it. The children came from a broken home. And any time that there's a broken home, there is going to be heartache, and there will be outcomes that are less desirable. And so our goal is not for children to grow up in a home, but to have them grow up in a home that's not been broken, because that's the best outcome. And we can see that from the studies, that when there is a broken home, the outcomes are less than desirable. And when there's an intact home where it's not been broken, and that's when children are happiest. And if we personally were to choose our own upbringing, none of us would choose a broken home. And so even though the picture is painted of happy families, of all these different types of marriages, um, the only one that's not broken is the intact biological family. Fantastic. Well said. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I'm going to play by the rules because, okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I have a son that has a very scientific mind and uh, he's been re raised in our home in religious tradition. He's having a crisis of faith right now because he's a geology major and he's reading a lot of science and um, forums and anyway, and he, he still believes, you know, he's not gone, but um, when I say things, he wants evidence. He wants proof. And so I'll give him some proof. <laughs> and, and I think it's fair yeah. to want evidence. It is. I do too. Yeah. Uh, to not just say, well, you're just coming up with this because that's your religious belief that's your or belief. Yeah. you know, your your own opinion or whatever. So um, if th this topic hasn't come up, then this would not be an issue for him. But so if someone were to say, and I'll say just for one example, that we have got a study that um, has studied a large sample of gay and lesbian parents 
in comparison to biological parents. And there are many different outcomes. They are not the same. Um, and every one of the outcomes that they measured, um, the children of gay and lesbian families had worse outcomes than biological. One example is um, they did a depression index and um, they interviewed young adult children. They had statistically significantly higher levels of depression than young adults from intact biological families. In fact, the young adult children of gay family parentage were twice as likely to have thought about suicide in the previous 12 months as, as the children of the lesbian ones, and almost five times more likely than the children of biological parents to have those suicidal thoughts. So that's just one of many different negative outcomes that come from same-sex parenting. Fantastic. That's great. Okay, well, thanks everybody for coming. Oh, wait. Oh, no, no, no. No, no. No, David. I want to make you suffer. Okay? I'm going to think of a good one. Um, do you have time for me to think of a good yeah. one? Okay. I have one in my head. Okay, let's have it. Please, yes. Okay. Make yeah. it good, or I'm, or I'm going to, you know, okay. make it worse. Also, I won't be burned at the stake for taking the other side. But, um, so right. this is a great study, but we were just in the plenary session with Dr. Fagan who talked about... Um, the, the, the negative effects of living with divorced parents or so in a society where um, so many children do not live in intact biological families, what's the difference? Why not why not live with two moms or two dads versus being with a single mother? Right. Or even let me make it worse. Think of all those poor kids half of them foster care, they could be in a decent home being loved by two parents. Right? Because the study doesn't always compare, uh, there's some paragraphs where it leaves out, um, maybe it doesn't leave out, but it doesn't state what the effects are on a child in one of those. In one of those other situations, yeah. Great, great question. So, um, in a reading group, we're going to break the role play for a second, you're not expected to be the expert. And so I'm going to say, that is such a great question. Let's open it up and see what we can come up with. <laughs> <laughs> you rephrase it and, and and just, it. So you said Pat Fagan in the last plenary. He, he, he showed us lots and lots of graphs about the negative effects to children who are in any kind of situation other than an intact biological family. Um, but the fact is, given other statistics, most children are being born into other families besides intended families. So if that's the norm to, to not have two parents, why not have this other situation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so a great man I know, let's use the metaphor. Um, a shirt. He said his mom loved to sew. And he grew up in a poor family, and when his mom uh, wanted to make them new clothes, she would sometimes look through the catalogs, where she would go to a store, and she would look closely at the pattern of a, of a coat or a shirt or some new piece of clothing. And she was good enough that she could then study that well enough and go home and make something similar. It wasn't really how she liked it, though. What she really wanted was a pattern, right? So she knew she was doing the exact thing. She was just kind of eyeballing. And what he said was, what would happen if someone made a copy of the copy, and then a copy of the copy of the copy, right? Instead of having the pattern, the ideal pattern. And of course, he said, eventually, you'd end up with your shirt this way, and your seams going down the front. And you know, over time, you would have this real evolution. And so he said, the job is of concerned citizens and others is to hold up the ideal the gold standard. All of us live specific lives. None of us live quite to the ideal. But that ideal is something we should hold up because we need to get closer to it as close as we can. And not say, this is the ideal, when really it's three or four generations maybe removed from the ideal. That so was that would be phenomenal. Let's give it a And actually, gold standard is in the conclusion. That's right.
Awesome. Okay, we're going to break the role play and thank our participants, and then we're going to debrief, okay? Okay, so a couple of things that we learned from the role play. Number one, um, all comments are safe, okay? That's the beauty of a reading group, is that all comments are safe. People are free to bring up their religious beliefs. People are free to bring up their half-baked answers. People are free to try something out for the first time. All comments are safe. Um, and, number two, all questions are safe. All. I don't think there's a one that I haven't heard yet, including that one. <laughs> so, all questions are safe. And it's not up to the reading group leader to come up with an answer. One thing I've done in my reading groups is, um, even when I can answer the question, it's not always best for me to answer the question. What's better is to say, what a great question, let's open it up and see who can answer it. If I had answered it, we never would have known. Leland had such a great response, right? Um, another thing we've done, if nobody has an answer to a difficult question, we will write them down. And everybody can think about it over the next few weeks as we read more and more material. Yes, ma'am. If you say all, all comments are safe, how do you do that and still make sure that you keep a spirit of compassion and of hope for the future and stuff like that? Thank you for bringing that up. Um, <coughs> the point of one of the one of the benefits of reading groups that we talked about earlier is that people come away more compassionate. Not everybody enters the room compassionate. Not everybody enters the room with the right vocabulary. And so um, I think it is up to the reading group leader to, at the beginning, establish a feeling of compassion and understanding and um, acknowledge that everybody in the room is coming from a different background. Likely somebody in the room has a very close relative who's struggling with something we're going to discuss. Um, likely this has touched people in different ways. And so as we comment, we can, we can speak our hearts, but um, let's be sensitive to the feelings of others. Um, so I think it's important to establish that. You're right. But within that, all comments are. Do you write those down? Like, establish that these are the norms of our group and we're all going to be safe? Let's, I mean, is, it, is that how you do this? Um, in the curriculum, I'm going to show you, they do have a document like that that you can show your reading group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you put on, like, no cell phones? No cell phones. Everybody has to be brownies. <laughs> 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 exactly. I was a research scientist in a. <coughs> in the um, industrial laboratory for 29 years. And so when I read this and I heard the discussion, there were some things, cautions that I'd like to give. First of all, as an example, 59 studies did not determine that they were the same. The composite, the, the American Psychological Association put together, their conclusion was they were the same. I don't know what the study said. Some might have been up and some down. And they said we can't sort it out or we want the result to be a certain way or something. Right. Uh, there was a lot of overstating and understating. We tend to overstate our view yep. and understate the other side. Um, for example, there are only 25 of the 40 uh, measures that were statistically different. Mm -hmm. Not 40. And so, and, and the problem that I've gotten into with discussing these sorts of things is if I get carried away and overstate or understate and someone has a different view, that's where they're going to go. I mean, it's, it's, you've got to be very careful to say what the data say and not uh, massage it. But, the, but uh, the other thing is, if someone says there's no difference, the first thing I would ask, I would ask to respond is, what do you mean? The environment is not different. The relationships are not different. There are schooling, you know, results in school. What happens, you know, later in life? What do you mean there's no difference? And then start talking about you know, if, if the person you're talking with is married and they say there's no difference between a man and a woman, I don't know. <laughs> they've, they've, been on, they've been isolated on an island for 20 years. They haven't lived their spouse for very long. Right. There was a comment in, in the early 
earlier meeting about about uh, you know these differences show up that, that daily or yearly, and I would lean over to my wife and say, an "Hour, you know, by the minute, uh, it's obvious that there are differences." And but we but we might be answering the wrong question or responding to the wrong thing. Those are some great points. Great points. One thing I like to point out to my reading groups as we so. Um, at the end of every session, I like to challenge everybody to practice answering the difficult question, which you just saw. Um, and one thing I remind them is that if you are in a debate with somebody, or if you are, um, if, if somebody is, or, or if feelings are getting heated, you're in the wrong conversation. Our goal is not to go out there and and create a lot of contention. That's not our goal. Our goal is to be able to articulately defend our beliefs to people who legitimately want to hear them. And so, um, so I think that creates a certain level of comfort. It's not your job to go convert the world. It's just your job to be able to say what you believe compassionately and, um, and to, to the people who are, who are really interested in knowing. Yes? Yeah, I have a question. Now the group that we had were mature, they know things. Now generally when you have young adults, what is the kind? Do they talk? Do they, because in India, if I bring up this topic, I'm sure very few people would talk about it. Right. So here, what is your experience? Um, so my experience, I have a couple thoughts. One, one thing is um, I try to choose topics for my readers that are going to be relevant. Um, so I try to think, what are they encountering in their, in their environments that they want to talk about? So if it's something that nobody's encountered, you're probably going to have less comments, you're right. Um, but I try to ask at the beginning, so has anybody, and I, and I did this just now, has anybody encountered this question or had somebody ask them this question? And then I can kind of find out, is this an issue that people are dealing with or not? You know? um, another thing... I would say is that young adults are very happy to discuss their experiences, um, even even if they don't. Even, they're they're very happy to say, "Well, this is what happened to me, and I have no idea what to say." You know. So a lot of people just now they had great responses for things, but my age group, most people are like, "Well, let me tell you what happened. It was a horrible experience, and I have no idea what to say, and I probably did the wrong thing." You know. The and the the final thought I had. Um, if it will come back to me. <coughs> oh, the, the final thought I had is that um, in some of my reading groups, I will start with a news story. I'll just say that I, that I didn't assign. If I read something in the news that week on the topic, I'll say, um, I just want to start with this news story. And then people realize, even if I haven't encountered it, it is happening. And so it's worth talking about. Great. Yes, Lou. You know, after you make some kind of presentation, you always have it play through your head again. You can think of what you could have or should have said right. differently, right? Well, can I make just one comment of how I would ch change my response? Yeah, please. Based on what you said, you, you wanted to ask them a difficult question and help them practice responding civil civilly, right, with civility and diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And that made me think that um, it really is important for us to to find find um, common ground and civility, right, in our efforts to be civil, I might have said something like, you know, you and I, David, both uh, want what's best for children, right? We, we have the same desire. And there are a lot of people in the world, in fact, I would dare say almost everyone in the world wants what's best for children. And so perhaps there's some different points of view on how to get there, right? What is the cause and effect relationship? Now, this particular study, shows that, at least correlationally, there's you know, a higher incidence of sexual abuse. And you know, I think most people in the world can agree that that's not good for children. Right. So, you know, and Start I think I would have taken that approach to say, there's more in common than we really think here. And most of us in the world have a lot in common. If we can focus on what's in common, then I think that's a better starting point than you and I fundamentally disagree. Right. <laughs> Right, that's a great comment. Thank Fundamentally, you. agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to pass these worksheets around, and we're going to. Um
we have about, uh, I'm going to try to do this in 20 minutes. Um, this is where, yes, thanks. By the way, this is my awesome sister, Mimi. She's from New Mexico, and she has started reading her style in New Mexico. Um, So for the next 20 minutes, we're going to go through this worksheet, and this is a very hands-on, we're actually going to think through how would you like to start your own reading group. A um, couple things that are nice to think through uh, beforehand, and then when you go home, you'll kind of have this plan of how, how you'd like to do it. Number one, who would I like to be my co-host or secretary? Some people are not comfortable hosting a reading group on their own. Some people would much rather get together with their best friend or have it at somebody else's house or whatever. Um, if that's you, write down who, who you'd like to co-host with. If it's not you, great, you can do it on your own. My co-host is Melissa. We always do it. We always do it together. It's a great time. So go ahead and write that down. I'll give you just a few seconds to get to that. <coughs> Okay, now let's think through how often you'd like your group to meet. Some people meet once a month, some people meet once a week. I like to do once a week because people in my age group want to see a beginning and an end. And I can tell them it's going to be every Tuesday for the next six weeks and then we're done. And they're like, okay, I'm going to do that. Um, some people would rather do it kind of like a book club, which may be once a month for like a year. And they want to spend a little bit more time on it. So think through um, your friends and your, your circle and um, kind of what you think would work for you. How often would you like to meet? Okay, then I want you to think through when you want to start your reading group. By the way, I'm not going to collect these, okay? This is totally for you, okay? Um, when would you like to start your, your reading group? Are you thinking... I need to get through Christmas break before I do it. Are you thinking I'd like to start on Monday because my family needs this information now? Write down when you're thinking you'd like to start. And then, maybe the most challenging one, I'll give you several minutes for this, I would like you to write down who you would like to invite to your reading group. A couple things about inviting. Um, number one, my wife and I always write down a list of names and pray about them. Because <laughs> not everybody likes this topic, especially in my age group. We always pray about them and then we go out and invite. We prefer to invite in person. I've tried inviting in person and via email. It's not the you have to do it one way or the other, but I feel like in person you can kind of explain what it is a little bit better to people um, and let them know that you are personally inviting them, that you really you specifically thought of them and you'd like them to come. We've also found that about a fourth of the people that we invite come. So we usually invite 12 or 15 couples and we usually end up with three to six couples that come, which is fine. It's not that the others are un uninterested. There, it's just time. time, things get in the way, some people, it's a bad semester for them, whatever. So I want you to take a minute and just write down, fill in, fill in all these spaces if you can, of people that you would like to invite to read your home. Yes? Um, what would you think about like, announcing it in a church and then whoever wants to go this way and say, um, see what do you think about that idea? I have a couple thoughts about that. It depends. It kind of depends on the culture of your church. If your church is totally open to announcements like that, great. Um, if not, it, it depends on how you present it too. Some of these topics people will feel a little bit threatened by. Um, I've also found that if you just kind of put it out there, not a lot of people will raise their own hand, you know, or come talk to you. They're much more likely to respond if you go straight to them face to face. Um, so I would, 
I would not totally shoot down that idea, but I would say there may be other more effective ways to apply it. Well, yes. you try to make some age groups and say I have been to groups where age ages have mixed and it's fine. But I do but I the groups that I've done where the ages are similar, they tend to connect a little bit better and um, maybe the relationships are longer lasting. So but it, it totally depends. Some people start with their family. We've had people start with their family and it works great. Um, so I would I would just say depends on who you're inviting and it's up to you. Yes. Have you started in a college setting? I started in a college setting, but I've seen it in lots of different settings. So, so it works in a college setting? Mm -hmm. Yep, for sure. It'll work in a college setting. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, go ahead and write down names. <laughs> On the next page, you're going to think through what topics you would like to cover. If it were me, I would cover all of these topics. Except that, I found that people may not want to commit to coming to so many sessions. So I've had to go through these topics and combine some and think through which ones are most applicable to my circle of friends and um, which ones maybe my peers are facing the most right now and need the most help with. Um, so just take a moment to circle. You don't have to come up with a comprehensive plan right now, but just kind of circle the ones that are listed on here that you think you'd like to cover. And maybe there's some other topics that you've heard covered here at the World Congress that aren't on this list and you can write them in the other slot or just um, those you're totally welcome to cover whatever. These are just some ideas. Yes. Do you ever experiment with inviting the group to determine what their topics are? That's a great idea. That's a great idea. I haven't heard that. Dave. But that's I, a really good idea. Have I you? was just going to say that usually when we first meet, we'll um, just discuss what, why are you here? What would you like to get out of this? Then you awesome. can tailor it to the group and to what their needs are and what they're facing. It's a great way to do it. That's a great idea. Well, can great I idea. ask an associated question since we came in late? Well, yeah. We probably covered this, but are you, do you generally focus on like-minded people? What, what is the aim of who you invite? The aim, my, my personal aim, this doesn't have to be your aim, my personal aim is to give people the vocabulary that they need, people who already have the belief but lack the vocabulary. Those are the type of people that I target. Um, because that's, that's where my passion is. My passion is helping people who otherwise might have struggled with these issues have the vocabulary and the understanding to, to um, stay strong in their beliefs about family. So yeah, I try to choose people, and, and people are going to self-select out if they, <laughs> if they don't like these topics. Oh, maybe. Yeah, but also, sure. a reading group is a, a perfect setting to help people find that vocabulary. It's not something that can happen on in a magazine or on Facebook or in an advertisement. It really takes that one-on-one -on -one conversation, so it has a value in a way that other things don't. Yeah. And I, I think that that's the value in this grassroots type of a movement because you give people with the same belief the vocabulary. They go out and have conversations with people, and maybe they just say, they, they have a statement that they say to somebody that triggers a thought in somebody else's mind. Oh yeah, maybe I do believe this, and then it can spread. Other people then get the belief first and start coming to a reading group and get the vocabulary, and then go out and, and it spreads from there. Awesome. So we're there to let people feel empowered to go out and say things that will spark interest and make people think a little bit that may not feel like they're like-minded. Fantastic. Yeah. 
question? Okay. Yes. I have a few questions, and you probably answered them all. I can tell you have already, actually, because I, I came in late. The Canavox, now, is, is that the source that you go to get your articles or the... the I was just getting there. Oh, you so were you just, you having, there. okay, no, so yeah, I was going to ask you where you get your material for one. Yeah. And the other comment I was going to make is, what would you do in a situation where, um, because this is actually something I've already experienced here at, the, at this Congress, uh, speaking with somebody who is, who is in here, uh, not does not affiliate with this the, the people of this group coming in from as an insider or as an outsider, and when you're talking about statistics, and this, that's why I loved what this man, this, the guy that was sitting right there, loved the comments he made because he didn't really use statistics for it. Um, using statistics, I'm finding sometimes they say, well, those have all been debunked, or you know, and and I think it happens on both sides where they're like, well. Who's, who did you get those statistics from? And, and, and it's like one group against the other. And so sometimes the it doesn't seem like the statistics make any le leeway with that. So what would you do in a situation like that? That's a great question. That person actually said that the, the man here, is it Mark Rigaris? Rignaris? Rignaris. He said, oh, his, most of his work has been debunked. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, whether, and, and I know that's one side coming from the, I, I get that, but, yeah, you know. You. So, so let me answer, try to answer both of the questions at once. <laughs> okay. Because, um, I'm going to mention Canavox. Um, Canavox is where I get my materials. It's not where you have to get your materials. At, at, when I started reading groups, I made my own materials. But this is one. Is that a dot com? It's a dot com, yeah. This is one source to get materials from. Canavox mixes science and personal stories. So, some people you talk with are going to need the science. Some people you talk with aren't going to care about the science or actually going to hate the science, and they're going to want the personal stories, okay? So I, so I feel like a balanced approach is what you need, and it depends on who you're talking to. Um, I'm a person that, I, I am a PhD student. Science is my life, but I, but I only trust science to a certain point, okay? So um, not everybody... Some people you talk to are just going to want the statistics and they just believe every statistic that they hear. And other people are going to be really critical of the science and you're just going to need to explain the personal side. Okay? And, and still other people are just going to want the religious side and maybe you already have that. But the, but the Canavox, um, things that, the Canavox curriculum I'm going to show you tries to balance the science with the personal stories because both are important. Um, okay, so... Like I said, I don't work for Kinovox. I do not represent them. That's my disclaimer. <laughs> However, this is where I, this is a public website, and this is where I get my curriculum, okay? So if you come over here, it's kind of giving me like the mobile version. <laughs> um, but you can go to readings, and they have readings divided by topic. Once it loads here. So you can scroll through. They have some material for the kickoff meeting. This is where you can kind of establish the tone of your meetings. Um, some documents about that. They talk about the magnificence of marriage, friendship in marriage, understanding same-sex attraction, um, loving those with same-sex attraction, divorce, the hookup culture, cohabitation, marital love, communication in marriage, same-sex marriage, same-sex parenting, sex ed in the family, sex ed in the schools, pornography, um, transgender identity, donor conceived children or third party reproduction, religious liberty, marital intimacy, and the importance of married men and fathers. This website, they keep it updated, they keep um, the links current, they are very careful about the research that they choose to put on here. Um, so I use this, but you don't have to. This is just one idea. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, so could you just look at like, uh, just pick one. one and look at it as a sample? Why do we? Why do they have so many articles for each one? How? Thank you. Yeah. You have to read all of that, or no? So they will have so like under pornography, they have two. You can do these as strongly recommended, I guess, and then like pick one of these. Um, my experience is that you should not overload your readers. Mm -hmm. You should pick one, maybe two articles. Like I said. I try to do actually one article and like one video, <laughs> okay? Um, your readers, may, maybe some people will want more, and maybe you want more as the group coordinator, um, and you're welcome to read more, but 
but my recommendation would be to kind of skim through the titles and pick the ones that look like they would apply to your group the best and send them out. Um, you can see here that they've got the personal story and um, the science. They try to they try to have both. So yes. Could you ever do Oh, yeah. Suppose uh, the, per the person that group comes into the group but has not done the reading. Mm -hmm. that, that happens okay? all the time okay. and it's totally fine. Okay. Yeah, I just tell them, I actually start by saying like, uh, if you're able to do it, <laughs> if you're able to do the reading, what are your thoughts? You know? So I don't start ever with the summary of it? Huh? Start with the summary of the reading. I usually say, somebody who read it, can you give us a nice summary? Okay. Yeah. Great. Great question. Not everybody will have time to do the reading. That's do you provide hard copies? No. I don't. But you could. Which, in some ways, is kind of nice. I mean, you do a book club, and everybody has to buy a book every month. That's a secret. <laughs> this is free. I actually think this is kind of cool. <laughs> yes. So you're saying it takes about six sessions. You're saying, or do you do I've topics? done six sessions. I've known people who have done 12. Are they doing different topics? Different topics. Time? Yeah, okay. or sometimes I'll combine topics. Okay. Yeah. There's not a lot. Okay. No, yeah. There's de there's 19 topics that they have listed here. Okay. But, um, yeah. Okay, before we finish, you guys have been really great. And I'd like to let you out a few minutes early, and then anybody who has questions can stay. Um, I put a sample email here. Some people hate email, so if that's you, here's a sample email. You can copy and paste. It's not copy. Okay? Sample email of what you can send to your group a few days before. This is what we're going to talk about. These are the readings. Hope to see you there. Okay? Um, so you're welcome to look at that and use that model. Um, and then I just like everybody to, well, let me say one more thing um, and then give you a second to write down a goal. So I want to just finish by. Um, telling you why I care so much about reading groups. Um, so I've been doing reading groups now, this, except for that one that I did a few years ago, the first one. Um, I've been doing reading groups almost solid for the past two years. And um, over that time, I have seen um, hundreds of people influenced by this, by these, this information. And here at the World Congress, there were some 3,000 people, which is phenomenal. But there were millions who couldn't make it here. And the power of reading groups is that I hold a reading group for so many weeks, and those people become empowered. And they hold reading groups with their circles that I can't reach. And those people become empowered. And it continues to spread. And it doesn't just spread like, like, the number of shares on the Facebook post, okay? The people involved are actually changed for a lifetime. They actually have real information and a deep understanding. And so it's a way that we can influence individuals and change the culture from the bottom up uh, because people have a deep understanding of marriage and family and they can defend it um, in, in many different circles and in many different ways. And so that's what I believe the power of reading groups is, and I'm, I'm so glad you all came. Will you take a minute before you go to write down your personal goal after listening to the presentation and participating? Um, maybe it's to start a reading group. Maybe it's something else that's come to your mind. Um, maybe it's to talk to a friend about starting a reading group together. Um, whatever it is, write it down so that you come away with some sort of concrete goal. And then at the bottom, is my email address, and you're welcome to email me about, um, about reading groups. Here in the state of Utah, we do large-scale trainings about reading groups every few months, and so if you live in Utah, you're welcome to come to one of those. If you don't, um, we can still help you from afar and encourage you to start reading groups wherever you live.